What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Kind of Funny Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Greg Miller, alongside producer slash seducer, Nick Scarpino. Top of the morning to you, Greg. Look at you. You're not hiding the eyes anymore. Nah, Just now it's it to the point where it just looks cool. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, now people cool. go like, would you it's, like so before it looked you like see I the got other guy? <laughs> exactly, right? It looked like I got my ass kicked in a fight, and now it's like, oh, you fought someone, but like no, you're like, you know, no, like what happened was you guys yeah. fought to a stalemate and then you shook each other's hands and we're like, Good good job, sir. Good job, sir. Now we're I, best I, friends. I just want to be honest with you. It does not, it's not at the cool stage. Put the it's the cool stage. On. Oh no, it's, it's not cool it's, it's not a good look for someone who um teaches martial arts. Mm. I do not teach martial arts, I take martial arts. I am still, in fact, a blue belt. That is a very low belt uh, to, to, to hold. And I get black eyes from that all the time just because people have rogue, you got rogue shoulders and feet coming at your face all the time. This, however, was a battle that I've had, Gary, with old age. And old age seems to be winning. I, can, I mean, I can relate to that. Yeah. You and I should do more content together, Nick, because I feel like you're the only one who really gets me, like, you know, age-wise. <laughs> Gary, I've often Well, said, these young whippersnappers. <laughs> If it wasn't for Greg Miller getting in our way <laughs> and holding us both <laughs> back, we would be superstars. Now, this is, of course, that voice is none of the rogue one. Gary, what the hell are you? I'm excellent, and it's always a treat. I feel like, you know, I you do a lot of kind of funny content. You know, usually two shows a week, X-Cast and, and, and Widow Wednesday on a Tuesday, and I get to do yeah. so much with you and hang out with you that it is a interesting one to bring you back to the kind of funny podcast because now we can just talk about whatever you know i don't have to even you know you don't even have to act like you understand game and news because you do a great job of acting like it now you well i was gonna say i always knew that if i put in enough hours and paid my dues doing all your b-list content you know like x cast and games daily eventually i get called up to the flagship show but Listen i have done here. this i have done this show before right and, 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 and you are also, yeah like, i was gonna say they're, they're, they're always standout too. they're always standout ones where you come on and you feed us weird british stuff that was when yeah. you were still more of a guest so oh that's then when right you came on at, right, to about rogue one at the end you cried like, yeah, i got emotional yeah i remember that you were all there for that yeah now of course you've written batman fortress we're yeah, talking yeah, about yeah. issue one today and hang out with you about that but we're also just gonna bullshit around don't worry about that of course forbes 30 under 30 aka the second best baby lose in San Francisco, aka the mustached one, Tim Getty. I keep saying this, but it's just like I, you know, I did it for a bit, right? A Top Gun bit uh -huh. for the review, and now I'm without the bit, but I still have the stash. <laughs> so Cody it's Hagler, just, uh, mm -hmm. Cody Hagler in the live oh, chat. Oh yeah, because like so Mike, Mike's kind of got funny. one as well, doesn't he? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, Cody Hagler in the live chat uh, on Patreon.com/slash kind of funny says, "Man, Tim looks so Italian right now, and I'm you here for so it." <laughs> So you look like either Italian or you look like you make the best cup of fucking crap I, coffee I've ever had in my entire life. I wish I had said this before I went on because literally I was like, I'm going to wear the beanie. I have yeah. the stash. Nick is going to reference me making coffee. It's 100%. inevitable. You guys so are writing these things Nick, down. And, and I know. Taking bets. I'm just showing it to the camera. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, like <laughs> fucking called it. <laughs> Italian didn't expect that. Did not expect that at all. But alas, here we are. Meow. Happy to give it to you. Happy to have it there. Now, of course, like I said, Gary, you're here to talk about the comic. Of course, we're going to talk about a million other things, too. Mm -hmm. But you stepped on a landmine right before we went live. And it's that thing where, like, I forget what show it was. Maybe it was like, you know, I don't, it's Everybody not when I watched. These days. But it was like ER, maybe. I watched ER, so it wasn't that. But maybe it was like <laughs> Chicago Fire or whatever. But I've seen it on TikTok, a thing where a person steps on a landmine and they have to, like, stop. And then the whole episode is like them trying to figure out how to get them off the landmine. And, and anyways, mm. your foot is currently on the landmine where you, Tim or Nick asked you if you had seen Top Gun. You said no. You explained, of course, uh, first off, having a baby in general, let alone the COVID concerns. And then you're like, but there's a new 40X theater near me. And that is where I made you stop because Kevin and Tim almost jumped out of their fucking skin to tell you about it. So what would you like to know? Uh, I, I'll step back. Tim, take it from here and talk about uh, 40. Gary Witta, my friend, I've known you a very long time, and I can tell you one thing. 40X is an experience unlike any other. Now, notice I did not say good, but also notice I did not say bad. Okay. It's an experience unlike any other that you really have to watch the right movie for it to hit right. Because if you watch the wrong movie, it is going to be the worst thing in the world. I mean, it, it, feels, it feels like Top Gun Maverick would be gimmick. the right movie. And I can assure you that Top Gun Maverick is the perfect film to yeah. watch in 40x yeah, right. i do not think it's even possible for it to be topped it is the peak of the 40x okay. experience kevin and i have now done five or six 40x movies and they range in terms of like was this a good decision what was it a bad decision most of them were 
my my multiple viewings of those things. So I kind of got a taste of of multiple uh, types of vi- of experiences of these films. Top Gun Maverick is one of those examples. I've seen it now in 40X and in Dolby Atmos, which I swear by uh, Dolby Vision, all that stuff. I'm Team 40X on this one, baby. If I'm okay. seeing it, when I see it a third time, it will be in 40X. I like how Nick's very politely got his hand raised. Nick Scarpino, so, kind of funny.com. What do you have to contribute to the 40X? Now, Gary, normally I just really like, like, I really enjoy disagreeing with whatever Tim and Kevin say mm-hmm. when it comes to anything artistic or technological. Uh, but I will say this. I saw Top Gun. I've only seen Maverick one time. Tim and I, and uh, I think it was Andy, went and saw it in Dolby. Phenomenal. You can't beat that. Having said that, I walked out of it, and a little party was like, I should have saw this in 4DX. Dude. The movie is so good, but it is just an experience. And if you want to experience it the best way, you got to move when Tom Cruise moves. Yeah, you really do. And then so here's the thing. All jokes aside, all bullshit aside, yeah, we've seen we've seen movies like uh, Jungle Cruise, right? Jungle and that 40X. 40X made it a little better. It made a eh movie like, ah, right? Same thing for uh, things like Free Guy that we saw. Yeah, yeah Whatever movie, but it kind sure. of enhanced the experience a little bit. Doctor Strange ruined the experience for me. Do not recommend okay. it. It was, wow, it was too wow. much Wait, it was what, distracting. What, yeah, what happened? I think like the, those type of movies, like were, they're good enough on their own that they don't sure. need all this other You're stuff. And it kind of gets distracting a little bit. Um, but Maverick is in this, this perfect, beautiful spot where it is a great movie by on its own. It does not need the gimmicks. But the gimmicks are so perfectly aligned with what they are showing us on screen. And there is a tactical, like, real feel to it all because t- uh, Tom Cruise and them are in those freaking jets, right? So it's like they spent the extra time and money and effort to really do some amazing aerial photography and all this shit going on. A lot of diving and spinning and twisting and all that mm-hmm. stuff. Whoever designed the 40X experience to match this movie was like, you know, I owe this to Mr. Cruz. I need to make sure that this is every single moment is perfect. And if wind should be blowing, you're feeling that wind, man. Nick Damn, uh, yeah, Nick Fun fact. I just read this the other day. They say the man can do anything. The guy that, that actually designed that experience was Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise actually went in. And designed the four. I'm just fucking with you right now. I, you said you had, it. Uh, you had me. I was like, this is too specific. But Can I you do it, He's like, now, he's like, I'm a stunt, I'm an actor, Academy Award winner, stunt stunt actor. I do motorcycles, pilots, and now recently the thing I'm getting into is is 4DX experience design. <laughs> Honestly, it. it's, it. it's so well made. Like there are, it's the only time I've ever had the snow happen in it, and it was a magical experience. A magical snow in the theater in California, yeah. Gary. Can I mean, you believe it? So this, so this is what I heard. I didn't know what it was, but they have opened a new theater near me. And because it's a brand new one, it has all the latest, you know, gubbins. Um, and I, I didn't know what 4DX was. I, I was familiar with D-Box and some of these other kind of tactile experiences that they have in the theater D-box now. Is a joke. And I've it's done a joke. Dolby. It's I've D-box. done the Dolby D-box. thing. I've done IMAX. But 4DX, I, I literally Googled, like, what is 4DX? And I was like, really? Is this is real? So not, only, so not only do your seats kind of, like, you know, lurch you around like a like on a roller coaster. It's- but there is like, it's they splash water in your face. There's like smoke effects. Yep. Like it's it's halfway movie and halfway a theme park ride, right? Yeah. So D Box, just to explain the difference here, D Box is essentially the precursor to 4DX. And you'd go to a theater, and it'd be a normal auditorium, usually not a special auditorium. So no Dolby, no IMAX, none of the fun formats, um, not no premium formats, but a row, like a single row of like four seats maybe eight seats, two rows of the theater would be these D-box seats. And they would move just a little bit. But okay. honestly, it was always distracting. It was always just jerky. It never moved enough, but it also was just moving way too much, the little that it does. It was just distracting and bad. It did not enhance the experience. Gotcha. 40X is straight up. Remember those theme park 4D rides that you I remember do Shrek or- 4D. Hell yeah. I did do. that. <laughs> I don't think that's, uh, is that a movie? <laughs> No, there's, so there's a there's a there's a theme park experience at I think maybe Universal used to have it called Shrek 4D, which is like a little short. It's like a 20 minute Shrek movie, like you know, properly animated with you know Mike Myers and Eddie Murphy and everything you'd expect from a Shrek movie. Um, but it's in this 4D type experience. So like for example, when they get splashed with water, you get kind of sprinkled with water. There's yeah. a thing where they drop spiders on the ground, and then there's little puffs of air around your feet that makes it feel yeah. like there are spiders. No thanks. Little 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 Forget things it. like that. So that was kind so, of the the closest I've come to a 4D experience. So that's it. Imagine that, but for a feature length film where every right. single yeah. moment is programmed to happen. Now here's the thing: it's not always doing something. If two people no. are just talking, you're not moving. 
And right. so it's like, that's the thing is like, it, it, <laughs> it'd be amazing. It'd be amazing when he that goes would in be for good, a kiss though, and yeah. it just goes under your face. Like this. <laughs> but I mean, there are things where it's like, there are, there's like little shit that like whips you in your feet and like the, uh, it shoots like air, air near your ears to your like ears. shock you and scare you. And it's it is so badass. Awesome. Every that's time so they cool. shoot a missile. So that, so that's the thing. So here's where I was concerned. Cause I kind of feel like it on paper, Tom got top gun Maverick almost feels like ex- maybe like a fast and furious movie be up there as well. But like top gun Maverick kind of feels like the, like if you ask the 4DX people to show you like, why is this good? Top gun mm-hmm. Maverick is the movie they would pair with it. 100%. Right. So they, like that yes. kind of experience. Yes. So, but so I, 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 you know, I'm led to understand it's a very good movie. When I see it for the first time, I want to have a good experience. You mentioned it can be distracting. If I see Top Gun Maverick for the first time in 4DX, is it going to be additive or is it going to be distracting? I think the Top Gun Maverick is the perfect example of it being additive. And that is because it of the type of movie it is and the type of right. experience yeah. 4D allows you. Like, uh, whenever you're moving, it feels accurate to how you should be moving. I think something like Fast and Furious would be fun, but I think that would hit the distracting levels. Like, there's just something about the cockpit of a plane and yeah. the way that these chairs move that, like, feels right and right. the wind i think the wind is like such a big factor it's magic it's magic it's and it's and it's scary. not spoilers to say that that's except that's you wouldn't really be experience. feeling wind on your face if you're in a fighter jet right you're in like, an enclosed cockpit but you're not, a lot of times you're not in the fighter jet you're outside <laughs> of it you know what i mean you're seeing it from the outside perspective gary one thing to note is like it is very close to too much like, okay, I like that. Sounds yeah. right though. Like just just one not short yeah. of too much sounds perfect. Like it's like, uh, do you have do you have drinks with you when you go to the movie theaters? I might. Okay, if you've got like an open beer, <laughs> it's gonna spill it. Like you okay. gotta get you gotta get yeah. one quarter down on that beer before okay. you start watching. How the hard movie. are you getting rocked in this? You're getting rocked You're- hard. So, so that's the other thing about this 40 How do we experience. put a camera on Gary when he goes into this thing? Dude, I want to see Gary's it. face. I want to figure this out. I'm going to like, listen, it's right down the street from me. They have these 4DX shows. I want to experience 4DX. I want to see Top Gun Maverick. And like you said, Tim, they, it's like peanut butter and jelly, like this mm-hmm. experience in this movie. Mm-hmm. I think I got to do it. I think you got to do I it. I mean, as the, well. uh, the only other, the only other competitor, if I'm saying like, I want to go balls out and sit in the best way possible, the only other thing I can think of is IMAX, but I've done that. I know yeah. what an IMAX movie is. It's, this yeah. is it's, this is very good in IMAX too, though. Now yeah, wait, I did let me ask you this IMAX. question, guys. For for the people that are the, the, for the tech guys, so I get this question a lot because everyone in my other friend group called Comics who don't ever do any research, they always go, "Hey, which one should I see this in?" And I just go, "I saw it in Dolby because that's what the, t- the Tim says Dolby." Should people have seen this in IMAX or Dolby? So okay. because a lot it's of good. it was shot in IMAX, right? It, it was all shot in IMAX, 6K right. IMAX. Like it's dope as hell. I mean, that's the thing is with Maverick, you really can't go wrong. But I think at the end of the day, the added audio quality you get from Dolby is mm-hmm. better than the added that's what picture I think, you get right? from IMAX. Because IMAX doesn't uh, have give the speakers, speakers really behind you, right? And what's and, okay? So are, all oh, all shit. the all the external bells and whistles of 4DX aside, how is the actual like picture and sound quality in a 4DX? <laughs> So, oh, so that's the thing. So it's fine. It's it's definitely not bad, but it's not IMAX and it's not Dolby at all. The biggest problem is some movies will shoot smoke. Like if there's an explosion, there'll be like a lot of smoke in the room. And right. it can take a while for that to dissipate so it can get a little distracting. This movie doesn't have that problem. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with okay. the amount of air. Being I just, blown. it's still, I, I, I feel like if, if I'm in, if I'm in like a war movie, right. And there's bombs going off and now there's smoke coming up in the theater. I feel like my brain is too smart to go. Ooh, I feel like I'm really in a battle. I hope I don't get it, shot. Like it's not, it's not really immersing me. Is it? I know it's a gimmick, it is, right? It is absolutely magic. I like, you know how like movies start and they've got the little, like, like special ones like IMAX or 3d have that little, special video they played to like be like this is imax the screen is bigger or like Mm -hmm. it'll start with a 3d countdown this does the same thing but it's with like all the effects that you can see and like every single time that video gets me and i get so worked up and i'm just like yes yes i love this so, so here's the thing. It's like the the smoke and stuff can be distracting. Like we're saying, it's like and it, like a war movie. I wouldn't necessarily say you should watch in 40x. That's why I think Maverick works because they they stick to the things that work for the film. But uh, to Greg's question of how hard is this rocking you, I will never ever anticipate how much it rocks you. And I have done it multiple <laughs> times now. Like there is a moment and like. Here's the thing. If you're one of those people that is like, I don't want to hear anyone make a single sound in a movie theater when I'm watching a movie. This is not for you at all. But if you like 
theaters being experienced, especially for movies like Maverick that are cheerworthy movies that have tons of moments that are like, fuck yeah, let's go. 40X is for you because you'll watch the trailers and they're usually not in 40X. They're just normal. And then the video that Kevin's talking about will play where it just introduces you to 40X. And that is the moment that everyone realizes what the fuck they just signed up for for the next two hours. You were getting rocked so hard and everyone's just giggling and just so into it. And it sets the that tone sounds great, though. to give them a moment to get over the ridiculousness of it before the movie starts. And then once the movie starts, there's always moments where like some crazy move will happen and everyone in unison is just like, y'all, we just experienced that. Incredible. Like it, it is such a thing that enhances certain movies. I would not recommend it for everything. I would wholeheartedly recommend it for Top Gun. Yeah, Maverick. I think I got to do it. It's, it's, Tim, it sounds like what you're saying, as much as I've got like a, a, a sense in my head, in my imagination of how much this chair is going to l- throw me around, it's going to be more than that, right? It's going to be more than that. Like legitimately, Kevin saying that a fourth year drink will be gone, I think that is <laughs> not enough. Man. I, got, it is. Okay, you, I mean, you sold me on it. I got to do it. I, <laughs> I love it, man. Let me know. Let's go together. <laughs> Tim, I'm like, what, I don't want, what I don't want to do, because again, if it was just like, if it was like a Fast and Furious movie that I didn't give a shit about, about, I would I would go but because everyone's saying that Top Gun Maverick is legitimately such a good movie and I want a better experience on that level what I don't want to do is come out going yeah that was a great movie but I kind of wish I'd have seen it without all the extra bullshit you know a couple I, things I, there I, Gary I need to hear you giggle I need to be next to you I need to hear you <laughs> giggle when you experience this and I will say that the only feeling you're gonna have leaving Top Gun no matter how you watch it is how can I immediately watch this thing again in any format so right there's okay. no worries there if you're like oh I wish I could experience it. Dolby or IMAX. Guess what? You can. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Gary, if you do, if you do go and you want pals to go with you, I know for a fact that Blessing really wants to see in 4DX and I'm also I'll go with Blessing down. so the only I'm way I can do it because of all my par- parental responsibilities and what have you at home the only way I can do it is go to like the late show which I think Perfect. is like a 10 like a 1030 show or something Love so that. if somebody oh, wants right. to go to like the 1030 show at Stonestown with me sometime in the next couple of weeks I'll def I'm up for it fuck yeah I love all right. this Greg you had a question yeah, Tim, Greg Miller from KindOfFunny.com. My question is this. You know that uh, rides scare me and make me car sick a lot. Do you think that would happen here, or am I going to be able to enjoy this? I don't know that about you. No, it's going to ruin your day. Yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> that, is a, that is a factor. This is a ride. Yeah. Greg, I'm can you not go on roller coasters? Though, right? Greg, no, I'm not going to find out. I'm not going to be doing like a roller coaster. You remember my panic when we, st- we stepped on the Millennium Falcon, and they closed the door, and they told you, put a seatbelt on. I immediately yelled at Andrew. I'm like, this is go upside down. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's like the, honestly, it, 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 if you can handle the Millennium Falcon, you can handle this. Okay. Yeah. Does it get like that intense? Like I'm like I'm like vertical almost. No. I mean, not like not you. Well, look no. At my, you know, no, no. It's probably like kids Star Tours. There. There's no seatbelt. There's no seatbelt. Is mm-hmm. it like Star Tours? It is like the most intense Star Tours yeah. <laughs> of all time. It's just Star Tours, Greg. You're fine. You're gonna be fine. Remember when he's like, "I'm a robot. I did this for the first time." And you're like, "Oh no." I know we've talked about Top Gun Maverick a lot on this show and many other shows, but over the I weekend, um, I was brought. It was brought to my attention um, that I don't know the lyrics to Danger Zone. Oh, and yeah. uh, before we started going live, Nick started singing mm-hmm. the song, and it was lyrics I was even still unfamiliar with. Yeah, uh, do you guys think that you're like confidently up to date on the Danger Zone lyrics? I don't They're, think Nick was singing Danger Zone. I was. And what were you in deep into the? Yes, where very were you? deep. Okay. Into it. In okay. fact, I, I in fact because I question myself all the time because of you guys now I was like I'll Google the lyrics because maybe I just pulled that out of my ass. You guys know that one of my you know uh, fallacies is the mm-hmm. fact that I don't actually know the words to any songs. But I'm actually surprised that I got this one right. What I said is the hotter the intensity, and I'm like I think that's a line in Danger Zone. And I read the first three stanzas and I'm like you're wrong so far, buddy. There's nothing about so, hotness in here. Then you get to out along the edges. Always when I burn to be, where I burn to be, the further on the edge, the hotter the intensity. Dude, it's incredible. But yeah. would you believe, Greg and yeah. Gary, oh, that God. this song starts off with the lyrics, revving up your engine, yep. listening to her howl and roar. Yeah, that's metal the under tension, begging you to touch and go. Highway to the danger zone, ride to the danger zone. Heading into twilight, spreading out her wings tonight. She got you jumping off the deck, shoving into overdrive. <laughs> Fucking Kenny Loggins knew it, dude. Kenny Loggins knew, knew it. Was talking about. He Kenny wasn't talking about planes, guys. The, 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 that song is, it's, uh, to me, it's remarkable how well that's, like, if, if that comes on in on the radio in the car, you are turning it up. There's just no mm, question right. about it. It's still a banger all, all yeah. these years later. The only other thing I need to know about Top Gun Maverick, and I, I'm sure the answer is yes, because how could they not? As much as I love the Kenny Loggins and everything else, what I really need is that anthem. I need the chime. 
I need that chime <laughs> sound. Oh, Gary. I need the anthem. <laughs> Tell me you that it's the chime. Tell me that it's there. Tell me that it's there. Times and it gets more exciting every time you hear it. So yeah. they don't, so they don't overdo it. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Well, they overdo, overdo it, it, but you're glad they're overdoing <laughs> it. Oh, it's oh, overdoing it's overdoing like, so, Gary, I'm going to set your expectations right now. The movie is is an experience. There's no nuance to this movie. Would I? Yeah. <laughs> there's. I, I like. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to like go in and uh, and mislead you in any way, shape, or form. But you're just gonna have so much fun. Yeah. Be, like, largely I, I, because it's it's based. You know, it's nostalgia. Uh, it, it's it's going back to Goose, all that stuff. But then right. honestly, when they're in the planes. It doesn't, it doesn't, you could literally, Tom Cruise could have just stood there for two hours beforehand and let you stare at him. And then they get in these planes and those experiences are, it's so cool and might be honestly one of the most unique things I've ever seen on, on, in the cinema. I'm excited. L listen, I, I have a very popcorn sensibility. You don't have to sell me on the concept of, look, it's just a crowd pleaser. There's nothing wrong with that. We need But it's like the best crowd pleaser you're ever going to see. Right. Like it is, it is, it is. I, I think if you read some reviews, people are like, oh, it transcends. In my opinion, I don't think it transcends anything more than Tom Cruise just proving to us that once again, he can make a super fun, really, really good two and a half hour long experience that you walk out of and go, I kind of want to see that again. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I'm going. I'm going. I mean, yeah, I was already, I, I, I already knew I was going because this was one of those where, like, I always remember, like, I deeply, to this day, I still deeply regret never seeing Master and Commander on the big screen. I saw it on. It's one of my all-time favorite oh, movies. I, I never saw it the way it was meant to be seen. When did that and this come is out? another one of those where it's like there are certain movies that, like, again, I don't get out that much. Like the only, like the, I've only seen one movie at the theater in the last two years because of COVID and everything else. Um, my daughter and I went to see Sonic Two because we really oh. wanted to see it, and we went to like a 10 a.m. show when it was like on a Wednesday when it was empty, right? So we didn't have to worry too much about people coughing and sneezing on us or anything like that. And we had a great time. And I remember just how much fun it is to go to the movies. And there are certain movies like this that. Clearly, there are plenty of movies that are fine watching at home, right? On iTunes yeah. or Netflix or whatever. But there are some movies that are so so clearly engineered for the big screen experience that you can't not go see them. And this feels like one of those. Oh, you got you guys. You have to hundred percent. I'm going. I'm going. To the All right, evening, ladies and gentlemen, this is the kind of funny podcast each and every, every week uh, four, sometimes five best friends gather on this table, each coming to BS with each other about whatever it is they want to BS about. If you want to BS with us, you can hit us up on patreon.com slash kind of funny over on patreon.com slash kind of funny. You can kick us a few bucks right in with your own topics, get the show ad free, get the show with the exclusive post show we do. And of course, get to watch live just like Matt Batson is the Lou is and Nick is. If you're watching live, have a good time chatted up in there we've already read a few different things from you it's been interesting you know what i mean we're hanging out keegan hill's laughing because we finally got to the intro but that's how it goes around here if you didn't know uh of course some housekeeping for you of course use the epic creator code uh kind of funny when you're making an epic games purchase maybe you're going to play that new season of Fortnite. maybe you get it over there maybe you don't want to go to patreon.com slash kind of funny and support us you can get the show on youtube.com slash kind of funny roostreet.com and podcast services around the globe of course if you didn't know, Summer Game Fest is upon us, and usually we try to keep church and state separate. We don't talk about them video games over here on Kind of Funny, but with so much happening in the world of Summer Game Fest, you need to be over on YouTube.com slash Kind of Funny Games or Twitch.tv slash Kind of Funny Games, where, of course, today, the very day this posts, we're reacting live to the PlayStation Showcase, or State of Play, as they call it. Uh, then next week, we'll be reacting live to the Summer Game Fest presentation. Then uh, myself, Tim, and Blessing are going to L.A. to play video games at summer game fest play days and then of course there's a bunch of other things happening and we'll be reacting to all of them if you ever miss it live on twitch.tv slash kind of funny games you can catch our reactions later youtube.com slash kind of funny games just like yesterday or tomorrow today today where today's ps i love you xoxo will be the post show from our playstation state of play live reaction thank you to our patreon producers anonymous nathan lamoth delaney twinning uh pargat Getting married, June Tet Singh. Congratulations, uh, Gordon McGuire and Fargo Brady. Today we're brought to you by Chime and Credit Karma, but I'll tell you about that later. For now, Gary Witta has done it, ladies and gentlemen. He dropped the dead weight that is Greg Miller and has penned a Batman comic called Batman Fortress Number One. Available, of course, comic shops right now, Comicsology, wherever you want to get it. We're gonna do a spoiler-filled episode of this one. I warned you ahead of time mm. that I warned you ahead of time to read this one and buy it. And of course, it's issue one of what is it? Six or eight? I forget. Gary. Eight. Eight. So oh, it's not like the whole story. Is, you're not like we're not spoiling this for, like the whole story for you. Just what happens in this book. Premise. So, Gary, where does the journey to Batman Fortress start? And when did you decide me to, to drop me like a bag of dead weight? <laughs> 
Was it so, as, soon as, as soon as they read it? Um, I've actually been running comics for for a long time. It's just not something I think you know people you know see me as like a screenwriter and you know, video games and stuff like that. But I you know done other things as well. I've written novels and and comics. Um, I did my first comic was a thing called Death Junior, which was actually an adaptation of you remember the PSP, the, baby. the PSP game? Oh yeah, back in the day. Um, for Image Comics, I did a series of um, Death Junior stories that got anthologized into two uh, graphic novels for, for kids, basically. They're kind of like, you know, for tween and teenage kids, and they're very, very fun, kind of Tim Burton-esque uh, kind of family um, comedy, like basically the son of the Grim Reaper. And it was very sweet, and I enjoyed doing that. And that was kind of my first entry point into comics So uh, some there, years ago. You're right. Yeah. We talk about the movies all the time, of course. Uh, Book of Eli, Rogue One, obviously. When that happened, how did that happen? Like, because you, of course, people don't think of it anymore, and we rarely talk about it because now you're, you know, we own you at Kind of Funny Games Daily. But like, you know, you were, of course, a video game reviewer who then became a writer. And in that time, it was that video game reviewer is what people knew you for. And then, you know, Book of Eli was this great big hit and put you in the screenwriter camp. W when you stopped being a video game writer, did you just write anything you could? Or were you looking for any writing job, period, you could get? So and yeah, it's weird the way that I kind of had I've had two almost completely separate linear careers. Well, there's been some overlap, but they re there really was like a definite kind of point where I stopped being one thing and started being another thing. I, as you know, I started out I was like 15 years old when I started writing about video games. We're living it straight out of high school, straight into uh, working on a magazine called Commodore User, where I, you know, they reviewed Commodore 64 and Amiga games. It was right at that like 8 bit to 16 bit transition in the late 80s and so i was working on that magazine for a while um and did that for many years i ended up you know, editing pc gamer magazine in the uk in the early 90s and then what brought me to america was when they launched the u.s version of it and i was supposed to come out to kind of help supervise the u.s version of the magazine the launch kind of like help it get it on its feet and i was supposed to be there like like, for like, like a year or something and then i would go back home but i really fell in love with the Bay Area, and I just, you know, I had always had it at the back of my mind that I wanted to kind of do screenwriting, like movies and games were my two big passions growing up. And I managed to kind of get my foot in the door doing video games, but like Hollywood and that kind of stuff always felt like, I mean, literally like, you know, half a world away sure, sure. growing up in the UK. But when I found myself in California, I thought, well, like, I'm geographically a bit closer now. I don't know how much of a difference that really makes, but um, I never really thought seriously about doing it. At that point, I had a very, very satisfying career in games journalism i was the editor-in-chief of pc gamer at the time when it was like the biggest games magazine in the world back when print magazines you know were still a thing um and i was just happy doing what i was doing and you know the idea of like also trying to it was like, well, like you know i had two dreams right i wanted to do movies and i wanted to be involved in video games and like i got one of them so like i'm done right it would be greedy to think about both uh, just be happy with the thing that you got. Most people don't get either, you know, if you've got like a, a couple of like things that you fantasize about being able to do for a living when you grow up. Uh, and so I just kind of like never, never thought about it seriously. But then around 2000, there was, you may remember, like the, there was a big dot com crash. There was a massive yeah. dot com bubble. Pets.com, never forget. Pets.com and all of that stuff. And the company that published PC Gamer had very much leveraged itself like into the dot com economy that a big magazine called business 2.0 which was all about you know the the new kind of silicon valley you know e-commerce frontier and all this kind of stuff and had built like basically all of its business operations were kind of based in the dot com uh, economy at that point and then the dot com economy had collapsed and my company had to close a bunch of magazines and lay a, a bunch of people off and i got laid off mm -hmm. and it was actually kind of scary because for a while there like my immigration status was kind of was tied into my employment at the company i had my green card was uh, application was going through at the time but i hadn't got it yet and i was like oh my god what is going i've been here for like you know 12 13 years at this point i don't want to go home i like it here and it was very it was very home, right what's that this is home at some yeah, point. Yeah, it right? was a really, it was, at that point, like I didn't know many, like most of my parents had already had, had also emigrated and gone elsewhere. And I had kind of lost touch with both of my, going going back home to England at that point, I would have sort of felt like, you know, starting over again, like, you know, kind of a, a, a stranger in my own country. And I was like, sure. I, I, and I really liked the US. And I thought, well, what am I going to do now? And I, I guess I could have got another job at that point because I'd been editor in chief of PC Gamer for a long time. I had a pretty good resume in games. I could have got a job at, you know, one of the websites because everything was transitioning over to websites sure. at that point. Print magazine was already kind of going away. And so I could have continued, or I could have got a job maybe in game development or, you know, continued to like play out the career that I'd already built for myself in games. 
Uh, but then I thought, no, I, I, I don't know. I kind of want to roll the dice a little bit. I, I, I still thought about doing movies. I'm again, geographically, I went from like being 6,000 miles away from Hollywood from like to like 500 miles away, which felt, I don't know, maybe. And <laughs> I had enough money saved up. I was still kind of, I'd always lived kind of paycheck to paycheck at that point. I was never very good at like saving money or anything, but I had just enough where if I lived very, very frugally, like literally kind of live. I remember going to the supermarket and buying all these canned goods, thinking like I can just live off canned food and ramen noodles for a while. You're like, it's like you're going into a fallout shelter, but it's the fall yeah. shelter from unemployment. Yeah, I didn't I didn't have I didn't have much money at all, but I had enough to live very if I was very careful with with my expenses, I could basically live for about a year before the money ran out. Um and I just started writing screenplays and I kind of saw, you know, read, read a couple of books about how to do it, read a bunch of screenplays. Um, you know, obviously I had been watching movies all my life. I, was, I, I want to do this. I want to give it a try. And I wrote, I wrote about a dozen of them. Uh, each one, and each one was like slightly less terrible than the last as I kind of learned from the mistakes <laughs> of the previous one and applied them to the next. And eventually I had one that I thought, okay, this, this is the first one that I've done that I'm not embarrassed to show to someone. And I kind of, I sent it around to different people in Hollywood that, you know, will look at these things. And, um, I got my first, I got my first manager. I got a call on a Sunday afternoon from this guy who said, I'm, I, I, it is, this is the thing. I, I, I did a keynote speech at PAX a few years ago. I was a keynote speaker at PAX West back in 2019. And I told this story and the whole theme about the whole theme of my speech was how my dad used to say, it's better to be lucky than good. Right. I think it's, it's good to be both, but like, you know, no, there are plenty of people out there who are really good. They just never got their shot. Right. Sure. And there's, and there's not really any justice necessarily in who makes it and who doesn't. Uh, but I've been extraordinarily lucky at like key moments in in my life. So, for example, I sent this script into a management company, a company that represents writers in Hollywood. And typically what happens is when a script kind of comes in through the front door like that, it goes through a whole phalanx of like readers and executives who <laughs> will read it and give coverage and will write their notes on it, whether they think that it, it, this should be considered by the company or whatever, until it goes anywhere near like a real decision maker, someone who could decide, oh, yeah, we're going to take this person on as a client or we're going to make this movie. Um, but my, but this guy who was like, he was the, he was the head of the founder of the company called me on a Sunday afternoon and said, I don't know why this script got put in my, like, take home to read at the weekend pile, but I'm halfway through and I already know I want to, I want to sign you. Cause I think the script's really good. And he was, I don't know how, why, I've, why this script was given to me to take home. Cause there's no coverage. There's no, usually there would be like a letter on the front from one of their readers or someone who had said like, this is why I'm recommending that, you know, you read this. And there wasn't any of that. And it turned out that um, it literally got put in, in, in his weekend read pile by mistake. That's awesome. It was just, it, it never, it, it, it bypassed, or there was any number of people in that phalanx, right, who could have like read it and passed on it. And I, you know, I don't have the career I have today, but it literally got put in the wrong pile by accident. Um, and it went straight to the head of the company and the head of the company liked it. So that was just like one of many examples that I could give you in my career where like, again, you've got to be lucky and good, right? It could have gone in the pile by mistake, but if it was crap, he wouldn't, he still wouldn't have called me, but it was good. And it also, but it also bypassed a, any number of people who might not thought it was good. And so, Tim Gage, know, Tim Gage from kind of funny, you have something to say? Yeah, just, just with this, like, I'm always so interested in like what a screenplay actually is, like, especially with the whole like story by credits versus like the full right. screenplay. Like, at this point, you're saying you wrote 12 screenplays. Like, is yeah. that like full ass movies, like all the dialogue, all that stuff? Yeah, and 120 pages, all the scene description, every line of dialogue, every beat, everything that happens in the movie. Typically screenplays are, um, there's there's kind of a rule of thumb that a, a, a page of, so, screen, so cr screenplays are very, very specifically formatted, A, to be easy to read, and B, you know, once they go into production, it's very easy for like the people that work on the different parts of the movie to pick out what parts are relevant to them. Actors can find their dialogue easily. Uh, special effects people can like easily figure out like where you know they're going to have to contribute something. Like everyone goes through the script and kind of sees their piece of it. Mm -hmm. But they're also formatted in such a way, like literally the margins and how many words on a page are structured in such a way that roughly, roughly speaking, and it generally works out almost exactly right every time. One page of a screenplay is one minute of screen time. And sometimes, you know, a very action heavy or a very dialogue heavy page might come in more or less than that. But over the course of 120 pages, it basically evens out. If you if you like, pick pick any movie that you've seen, um, you know, from the last 10, 20 years, go find the screenplay, go look at the the final running time of the movie. They're not they're not going to be far off in terms of minutes and pages. And so that um, that's generally how screenplays end up being. A two hour movie is 120 page scripts, basically. How long does it take you to write one of those? It really depends on the script. Book of Eli, I wrote in six days. Jesus. Um, wow. in a, in a, I mean, the first draft 
in because I was I was really really obsessed with the idea, and I knew like the movie already kind of existed fully formed in my head. The, the what takes me time and what where I get bogged down is in the logistics of stuff. Anytime that like a movie is very like like a murder mystery or something that's very like kind of plot heavy or like a Christopher Nolan movie where there's like layers upon layers and you have to kind of map the whole thing out on the page. And there's a lot kind of like logically going on and you're looking like a Swiss watch where everything has to kind of be very specifically the way that it is. That takes ages to do. And I, and I, I can do it, but it takes me a long time to kind of get it all, get all my ducks in a row. The thing, the thing about the Book of Eli was like on a plot level, it's very, very simplistic. It does not, there's very few kind of moving parts in the plot. It's a very simplistic plot. Apart from the twist, which is kind of layered throughout the movie, it's not a very kind of Byzantine plot with a lot of complex structure. It's a very straightforward uh, story. So I was able to kind of break the story in my head kind of very, very simply. And like by the time I knew what the movie was, it was already kind of fully formed in my head. And at that point, I just wanted to get it out on paper. So I was running like 14, 15 hours a day. Like literally, I would look up at the, the, the clock and go, oh, I should probably go to bed. It's got to be like nine o'clock. It was three o'clock in the morning. Because I was just, you know, when you know what it's like, you'd be playing a video game or You're in the zone. reading a book. Yeah, when, yeah, when you get like totally dialed into something, like the, the time becomes, you know, really elastic and irrelevant. So, yeah, I wrote that really, really, really fast. But, you know, other things have, t- you know, typically, like I'll give you an idea like what the expectation is. Typically, like, for example, when I'm given a movie, con- when I'm given a contract to write a movie uh, for someone, the writing period you know, from, from when I'm commenced to when they expect to see a script is about 12 weeks. So okay. you're, you're, you're expected to be able to write a script in about three months. Hmm. So you just do that in six days, though, and then fuck off for the. Like, well, the, again, uh, I, mean, I mean, again, that's not that's left. not that's not the norm. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I usually I don't know. I'm trying to think like the last the last few that I did, like first drafts. I don't know, like six to eight weeks, right? You know, writing every day, you know, a few hours like, a day. That's including sort of like the outlines and fleshing all that the actual story out before you actually sit down to write right no that's that's literally just for the actual script itself like to, yeah. uh, and, and and again it depends on the on the project sometimes they want to see an outline and there's there's a, there's a writing period for that like you may have 3 to 4 weeks to write an outline or a treatment and then once that's mm. approved you'll get the 8 weeks to write um the actual script and then for a re- for a rewrite and incorporating all the notes you get back from the studio that might be like another 4 to 6 weeks but generally, yeah, the expectation is that you should be able to write a 120-page script in about six to eight weeks. If you think about it, so like my over-under is about, if I can write five pages a day, that, you know, in, in that screenplay format, that I consider that a good day. So five pages a day, every weekday is 25 pages, right? But in about four or five weeks, you should have a script. Right. That's got to be, be super stressful, though, because you have to basically, like, if you get behind on that, you have to start making up pages every day, right? Yeah, yeah, kind of. I, the, the other thing is, like, it, what constitutes a good writing day for me is really, really malleable. Like, again, f- like, like five pages a day, and that's that's a nice thing to be able to hit. And again, once you once you're on page six or seven, you go, oh, this is all gravy. Like, I'm making up. You know, I'm 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 ahead of where I want to be. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I might not write five pages, but I might do one really good thing on one page that I love. I go, oh, that's great. Or solve a plot problem that's going to like unlock another part of the movie for me or have an idea that go, oh i can make the movie much better now one line of really good dialogue that i'm just really happy with that can that can still constitute a good writing day so it's not always as mathematical as this many pages per day right. i'm just saying a lot of writers like to kind of have you know like for, for novelists for example they like to do like at least a thousand words a day a lot of screenwriters will tell you like five pages a day and it's just to kind of keep you honest and, you know, because we all procrastinate. We'll, we all go clean out the fridge rather than, you know, we'll make any excuse not to write, right? Um, and so, yeah, it's nice to hit a page count, but it doesn't always have to be as rigid as that. Like, I mean, I've spent entire days where I'm trying to fix a scene and I'll write the scene 20 different ways and I'll, and I'll end up with the scene exactly back the way that it was. So on paper, it doesn't look like I've done anything, but I spent that whole day reassuring myself that I have the best version of the scene because even even if the first version of it was the best one mm-hmm. and I tried 20 other things that got thrown out I know it I know at the end of that that that's still a good day for me even though I can't show you a difference between the page like the page at 9 a.m looks different looks the same as the page at 5 p.m with a hundred different versions in between that I all threw out but that's still in its weird way six I, I've been I've been productive yeah that's still yeah, a good day for me done something yeah yeah does TV work the same way? Because I know, so you've done the movies, but then also you've done like episodes of Star Wars Rebels and, and other yeah. things. Like, uh, I 
how different is the formatting of a TV episode versus a, a movie and like the writing process? Is it still five pages a day? And does the minute rule kind of work there too? Yeah, roughly the same. When I did Rebels, I mean, so Rebels episodes when I mean, the thing about Rebels is it's much more specific because they have to hit an exact time number every time. So a movie might be 120 minutes, right? It might be, but it might be 130 or it might be 95 or, you know, there's, there's, there's no expectation for, you know, roughly we know that a movie is at least 90 minutes long. And these days, you know, they can go, you know, it can be three hours long. It really depends on the movie. Um, with TV and especially with like broadcast tele, it's different now in the age of streaming because things don't have to fit into a schedule. But like with Disney, you know, Star Wars Rebels went out on like Disney XD, right? That was part of a, a scheduled linear programming block. And so with commercials and everything, it has to be exactly 22. If you like look at, if you, for example, look at like the Rebels episodes that are available now on Disney Plus, you will notice that they all time out almost exactly 22 minutes because it's a 30 minute time block with about eight minutes of commercial breaks. And so you've got almost, you've got basically exactly 22 minutes that you have to fill. So if you've got, if there's, oh, well, this episode is like 23 minutes long, you know, the, the TV, the, the producer is going to say to you, no, 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 you got to make it to like, find a way, like you can't go over or you can't, you can't go short either. So with, with TV, you have to, again, specifically, in, in, like, this is going away because, you know, old fashioned, like now a commercial break and now the next show that's, you know, that still exists in network TV, but we're increasingly watching, uh, yeah, if you like, for, for example, watch a Netflix show, they don't feel like they need to hit those, those marks exactly the same because they don't have to worry about how many commercial breaks or the next show behind us has to start at exactly 9 PM or whatever. It's just, you know, you watch them kind of a la carte. So that is kind of going away, but on rebels where it was part of like, you know, regular, you know, Disney cable programming, um, each, each script had to be a very exact number of minutes and seconds. So movies, TV, no one fucking cares. It's about comics. I'm still, I still don't know how you got the comic part of it to go. You so, made all the different scripts. You got the agent and all that all lucked out. Was the agent also like, you should do comics? No, it was a totally, it was a totally separate thing. So uh, through people that I knew through the video game world, um, they were developing Death Junior at the time, and they knew that I had transitioned from uh, video game journalism into trying to do various kinds of storytelling and getting movies and things like that off the ground. They said, hey, would you be interested in helping us develop the story for Death Junior and doing it in a in a comic book form. We have we made a deal with Image Comics to do these Death Junior comic books. We don't have anyone to write them. Would you be interested in doing them? And so I worked with them and uh, we did two um, short series of Death Junior comics, which like I said, got anthologized into two graphic novels that Image Comics published. And that was kind of how I began to learn how to write in comics format, which is a very different, you know, type of format. And there's a different language to the way that comics are written that you know you consume a comic you read a comic you know differently than you might read a novel or watch a movie or a tv show so you write them differently with that in mind and so i kind of that was kind of how i first got my foot in the door uh doing it and then uh some years later i had a story that i really wanted to do um it was actually a screenplay that i had written it was that, that first screenplay that i told you that got me got me that first manager in hollywood I really liked that story, but I could never get it made as a movie. So I thought maybe I should like reverse engineer this into a comic book and try and do it as a comic instead. And I was trying to find an artist to work with me on it because, you know, I can write, but I can't draw. And I eventually found um, uh, Derek Robertson, who became a really you know, one of my best friends. And Derek obviously was already like a huge name in, in comics. He had done Transmetropolitan. This was before The Boys, but he was already the co-creator of Transmetropolitan with Warren Ellis. And he's written every DC and Marvel character under the sun. I thought like this guy, this is like an A-list guy. I don't know why he would talk to me, but he liked the idea <laughs> and he had known, he had known some of my previous work and we became really good friends. And uh, we started putting it together and we eventually, you know, found a home for image comics. And so that was like my first major comic book that I had done with and that was Oliver. And that was Oliver. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's see what happened after that. So this is now kind of bringing us into, into the kind of the current, Sphere. Oh, and so the, oh, through through my association with Star Wars, they said um, the Lucasfilm people said we need someone to adapt the Last Jedi into a comic book series for Marvel Comics. Would you be interested in doing right. that? And so I adapted the Last Jedi into a twelve um, issue series that got turned into the kind of the official Last Jedi graphic novel. I worked with really talented artist uh, artist by the name of Michael Spicer on that. That worked out really, really good. That was really fun because I got to kind of adapt. Obviously, I had to tell, tell the same story as the movie, but if there was anything I wanted to change within reason, I could. So I was able to kind of change little things about the movie that I wanted to do slightly differently and like add, like add and embellish things. And that was really fun. 
Um, and then what brought what brings us kind of to the present day is I think there's a guy at, at DC, an editor by the name of Ben Abernathy, who had seen, I think, Oliver because Derek works with DC and he works with Ben and he had seen Derek's latest book, which was which was Oliver at the time. And he, I guess he had liked it because he then reached out to me via, he got my information from Derek and said, hey, listen, next year is going to be the 80th anniversary of the Joker. And anytime one of the characters in the DC canon, like one of the major characters has a, like a major anniversary like that, we put out a little kind of anniversary book to you know, to, to celebrate them. And it's usually an anthology of short stories from different creative teams. And um, they said to me, would you be interested in writing a short, you know, a short Joker story? And it can be anything you want. Like it's outside of the regular Batman continuity. So if you want to do something really whack, almost like a, you, if you can do like a what if, you can do whatever you want with it. And that, and, and Greg, that's where you came into play. Because again, I love the Joker. I love Batman. I love Superman. I love the DC characters. But I know very well that like you love, like you live and breathe DC, you know, way more even than me. And so I thought you would be a really great person to bring in, you know, someone to kind of work on it with. And you and I wrote that Joker story. We broke that story together and we ended up with a shared credit in a, in a DC book. It was my first DC credit and yours as well. Yeah, it was awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> but Luck. so like when I did that open the door and then you had conversations like so now so now we're actually you know what now we're I think caught up to about we're on the precipice of where Batman Fortress comes from. But before we find out exactly, let me remind you, ladies and gentlemen, you go to patreon.com slash kind of funny where you can be watching live like Matt Grover is Paul Morris and of course Muffin Man Ian is. Uh, yes. and you can also get the show ad free and all that jazz with the post show we do every time. That's all on Patreon, but you're not on Patreon. So here's a word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Me Undies. I love Me Undies from head to toe all over my body. If you don't believe me, of course, right now, I'm wearing the Me Undies shirt. You can tell by the little tag going on right there right i got the me undies lounge shorts going on of course i got the undies and then boom me undies socks baby that's how we do out here at kind of funny i love being soft head to toe in the micro modal fabric you already know all about that but if you don't let's face it summer's sweaty but your butt doesn't have to be with me undies light and breathable micro modal fabric you can stay comfy and cool all summer long they have super fun seasonal prints and tons of styles to choose from but if you just like classic black that's totally cool too they got a bunch of just bold colors for you to go for they have super fun seasonal prints tons of styles and sizes extra small to 4xl so you can bring the beach to your butt without ever leaving your living room meundies has a great offer for all of you first-time purchasers you can get 15 percent off if you sign up for their free to join membership you can apply that 50 percent off to their already discounted membership prices to get 15 percent off your first order and a hundred percent satisfaction guarantee go to meundies.com slash kind of funny that's meundies.com slash kind of funny tell them tim getty sent you shout out to chime for sponsoring this episode no one likes waiting on a paycheck especially when you've got bills due good thing there's chime now you can get your paycheck up to two days early without direct deposit that's up to two more days to save pay bills and generally just feel good about your money situation but chime is about more than just getting paid early it's also an award-winning mobile app checking account debit card and optional savings account uh so what are you waiting for? Hopefully not your paycheck. Get started with Chime today. Applying for a free account takes less than two minutes. Get started at chime.com slash KF games. That's C-H-I-M-E dot com slash KF games. Banking services and debit card provided by the Bancorp Bank or Stride Bank N.A. Members FDIC. Early access to direct deposit funds depends on payer. Get started at chime.com slash KF games shout out to credit karma for sponsoring this episode want a new credit card but not sure how to choose you don't need to apply for the first offer that you see in the mail credit karma can help you zero in on the right option for you and apply with more confidence i love credit karma i've been using it for years to check my credit profile make sure everything is good and on the up and up uh, credit karma uses your credit profile to show you offers that are tailored to your financial situation credit karma partners with a wide range of card issuers so you can be sure 
that you're exploring all sorts of options. Best of all, Credit Karma uses your credit data to show you your chances of approval before you even apply, helping you apply with more confidence. Comparing cards on Credit Karma is 100% free and most importantly, will not affect your credit score. That is huge. Credit Karma, create your own karma. Ready to find the right card for you? Head to Credit Karma and check out your personalized mix of offers today. That's creditkarma.com or hit up the Credit Karma app to find the right card for you. That's creditkarma.com. And all right, so Gary, so we did the Joker story. And was that just like that got the connection? And then they came to you. Did you go to them? Did you go to Derek? Like where how did where does the fortress begin? I mean, it's 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 kind of a combination of 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 all of of all of the above. Well, apart from me going to them, they did approach me, but it was for a, a couple of different reasons. They liked the Joker story. The Joker story was was well received. Um and uh Derek was already again very heavily ensconced in uh, the Batman universe. He had just actually re- he wrote and drew his illustrated his own Batman uh, comic uh, recently for DC, and he had just done a big run on um, Hellblazer. He had done like a black series uh, Hellblazer comic for DC. Um, Derek is someone who is like you know he's considered like in the top tier of, of DC's artists, and he's like a go to guy for them. And basically, the reason why the Batman thing happened was because it, I think it all kind of came off the back of the Matt Reeves movie. Like they knew. Mm. So this, I mean, this is. So I'm going back like probably 18 months, uh, shortly after the, uh, the 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 Joker book. Like they knew the Matt Reeves movie was coming, right? And that was going to be a big thing in 2023, like the latest kind of reboot of the of the Batman universe via via Matt Reeves. And so, sure. and DC wanted to support that by doing a lot of kind of Batman related stuff. And there's a lot of Bat books out there right now. And part of the reason is because. DC wanted to kind of like surround the Batman movie with a lot of, you know, new comics and publishing stuff. Like, well, it's, it's not officially like shine a light on Batman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We really like, haven't had a lot of Batman stories. I don't it's even know. Like, I mean, like, who is this guy? Where does he come from? What is his origin story? Was he, was he bitten by a very rich bat? Like, we just don't know. Like <laughs> what, where, who, is, who is this down? guy? Who is Bruce Wayne? We just need to know more about him. Uh, but no, so like, it's not officially like the year of Batman or anything, but there's just, you know, DC was like kind of leaning into Batman this year, you know, in, in, in and around the Matt Reeves movie. And so, ben, and so I think initially what happened was Ben liked my Joker story. He already likes Derek because Derek does stuff all the time. He knew that Derek and I had worked together before on Oliver. And so I think, he, I think he initially approached Derek and said, would you and Gary like to work on a Batman book for, for 2022? Like an original thing, like pitch sure. us an idea. And so obviously I love that idea. I love the idea, the, the idea of doing a, a, a Batman book. Um, and I love the idea of working with Derek because he and I have always had a really good relationship. Like, we understand each other and we, like he knows how to make my stuff good. Um, and so here's the thing. I like Batman a lot. I like Superman a little bit better. Yeah. And so I said to Ben initially, like, could I pitch you? He said, pitch, pitch us a story. I said, could I pitch you a Superman story? Because Superman's my, my favorite. He said, well, no, we want it to be Batman because, again, it's, very bat- it's going to be very Bat-centric this year. And I was like, hmm, is there a way for me to do a Batman story but where there's, but Superman is also like a big part of it? So Batman Fortress is totally like it's a Batman story and it's all told like from the point of view of, of Batman and Bruce Wayne. He's the, the main like protagonist character. But I wanted to try and find a way, like even if Superman's not in it very much, if at all, I wanted the story to be in inform- I wanted it to be Superman centric and have a lot of Superman lore in it. Obviously, Batman and Superman, you know, in the comics, it's enshrined that they have you know, a relationship, they know each other, they're in the Justice League together, they've had like, you know, they, they've always had a really interesting um, relationship, you know, they don't see the, they don't, they don't see the world the same way, right? I think it's, it's, it's fair to say, and there's been a lot of interesting conflicts along the way. It's, for me, the high point, you know, still, I think most comics fans would agree, like still one of the greatest moments in the history of comics is the end of the Dark Knight, Dark Knight Returns, right? The fight between Batman and Superman, one of the great, great moments in comic storytelling of all time. And even in the Joker story, I put Superman in it. So in the Joker story, the idea is that Joker's finally killed Batman. And there's all these kind of eulogies to Batman going on and because it's been revealed that he's been Bruce Wayne all along. And they go to different men. There's a little, just a quick little talking head. It's like literally one panel. The Superman basically kind of commenting on the death of Bruce Wayne and Batman saying like, Bruce and I didn't always see eye to eye on everything, but like I respected it. And that was to me kind of sums it up. And I wanted to kind of get a little bit deeper into that. And so I, Derek and I talked about it and we came up with this idea of, a, of a, 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 a way into a Batman story that would be very informed by Superman and his world and things that go on in, you know, in, in, in his universe. And so that's, that ended up being kind of the, um, uh, the premise for Fortress, which is you know, there's a, a big alien ship, big mysterious alien ship shows up and it doesn't like attack us. 
uh, it's not like an, like an Independence Day type thing, but it starts essentially kind of radiating this this weird energy, saturating the Earth with this energy that knocks out all of Earth's power and communications and kind of like plunges the planet into darkness and causes all this global chaos. And this is the, obviously that's the kind of like global level threat where you would imagine Superman would show up, right? That's what he's mm -hmm. there for. Uh, but he doesn't. Like he's gone. Like he he does not respond. No one knows where he is. They can't find him. Superman's completely missing in action at a time where like Earth needs him the most. And so there's this kind of you get easy from kind of funny. You got a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just based on what you're just saying there. So so I read it. Love it. Everyone should definitely go check it out. Um, with it, I was a little confused about what the line actually is. Comics can be confusing, and you never know exactly what you're supposed to read. Fortress is an eight issue series, right? It's going to be yes. monthly coming out. You were writing all of them. Yes. Awesome. Very exciting. But my question is, does this tie into other events or is everything that's happening in Fortress, you can just read this and understand? Because from reading it, it I kind of get the vibe that it might be relating to ongoing Superman stuff that's going on that I'm from. No, no, right no, not at all. So the, the beauty of this is it's a, it's a standalone book. It's not awesome. connected. I mean, you know, it's canonical, right? Because it has a DC, it's DC, right? DC are publishing this book. This, this is not fan fiction, but it's not part of like the prime kind of continuity of Batman. You're the, the, the ongoing monthly Batman comics. Like, for, right, for example, right away, uh, spoilers for people who might not know this, but like in the, in the prime continuity of the Batman storytelling right now, Alfred is dead. He's not, but he's not dead in our comic because it's a separate story. This is, it's an eight issue series, but it's a, it's a closed loop. Once the story's done, it's done. And it's just a good Batman yarn that isn't, you know, all of the characters are there. Like your Justice League characters are there. Superman's there. Batman's there. Lex Luthor's there. All the, you know, it's, it's got all of your favorite kind of DC things in it, but it's, but it's it, familiar. But, we, but yeah, but, but we, but we can take some liberties with it. Like, for example, there are certain characters, I won't, again, won't spoil it. But there are certain characters where we've like completely reinvented like who they are and like completely different origin story from the one you know because it's our own story and it doesn't and it's not in any way beholden to the ongoing continuity of, of kind of the main Batman storyline. Dark Crisis right now. Does it have anything to do with this? No, because I will tell you. It's really weird that the issue ends with this. <laughs> and I'm like, huh, do I need to read all of these? I don't no, know. No, I mean, there's always, so I, I mean, it's a part, part of the challenge of, of doing a Batman story is he's been around for like 80 plus years, right? And so how do you, how do you come up with an idea for a story that hasn't been done before, right? Like any story I pitch to DC, they're going to go, yeah, we did that in 1976, right? Because so <laughs> many stories have been told in the Batman universe, not just in comics, but in film and television and everywhere else. Um, that, you know, how do you come up with an idea? It's like Simpsons did it, right? Like, how do you come up with something that's not been done? Like, for example, like, so I pitch this idea of like the, the opening issue is like very Gotham centric. It's essentially a blackout in Gotham City and Batman having to kind of deal with the fact that there's, there's crime all over Gotham City because all the power's out, communications are out, police can't respond, their radios are down, 911 doesn't work. Um, you know, the, the, all the electronic locks in Arkham Asylum have opened up. So Joker and Penguin and all the rogues gallery are out on the streets causing chaos. I thought that was a cool idea, but I mean, there's no way this haven't, ha hasn't been done before. Not only has it been done before, it li DC's literally got another book right now called One Dark Night, which is about a, a, a blackout in Gotham. So like, it's almost impossible at this point to have like a completely original Batman idea. And DC know that. Like if DC were like, oh, we can only do ideas that have never been done in any way, shape or form anymore, not doing anything. they would have to shut down, right? They'd yeah. go out of business because there's, no there's nothing like purely original left. It's how you approach the idea and what do you do? Actually, to be fair, what we're doing with, when by the time you get to issue eight, I guarantee you, you're going to say, oh shit, that's never been done before. Well, that's what I find interesting about it. You know, uh, Gary, you also, of course, uh, wrote and were a story consultant on the Walking Dead Telltale game. And what I always give old Telltale, who knows what new Telltale about, a lot of credit for was their Batman series and how you start that and you're like, oh, I get it. I know what all this is. But as the episode one ends and then the rest of the series goes, you realize they were veering into their own universe and really committing to it and really mm -hmm. doing their own stuff with it. And I like that about your book is that I've only read uh, issue one. It's all you've given me. You're a coward. And uh, 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 issue one is the same idea where you jump in. It feels familiar. It could be continuity, even though it isn't. But then there are these little moments where you start really, I feel like, playing with what the borders are and what you know right like there's a scene of you know batman seeing a bunch of looters in the middle of this blackout and talk and basically being like fuck capitalism i'm not gonna stop that that's not and it's like it's an interesting look at your batman you know and right. not, who's not who is not the batman yeah that is the continuity batman that's a really interesting it's, it's one page in in issue one and it's but it's got a lot of attention because some people really didn't like that 
some people really didn't like that Batman chooses to not and get involved in in a crime. Um, but some people really, really loved it and, and got what I was trying to do, which is the idea, again, there's crime all over the city. There's only one Batman. The police can't respond crime. to anything. There's way more than he, like, he, like whatever he does, he's only going to be able to like, you know, help out a little bit. Like he's not going to solve the problem with thousands of people, you know, in, indulging in criminal activity, like all over the city at once. He's got to prioritize. He, he has to decide like what is the most valuable use of his time. And he makes a decision that instead of, you know, dealing with people who are stealing TVs from a Best Buy, he's going to go, he's going to go, he's going to go save a, you know, a, a woman who's being drowned in Gotham Harbor by the Penguin. And, you know, a busload of school children that have been hijacked by the Joker. He, he chooses to prioritize protecting life over property. And some people have, have kind of, oh, Batman's gone woke or like, why, why is he not dealing with these rioters or whatever? It was, I, I, I thought. It was I, to me. It was an interesting way to think about Batman. People say, "Oh, well, Batman would always he would always fight crime whenever he sees it." And I think to some extent that's probably true, right? He's obviously very, very powerful. He's obviously very powerfully motivated as a crime fighter. But he's motivated because his parents were murdered in a violent robbery, <laughs> not because someone robbed his, his dad's TV store. And I think that ultimately, again, when if he had nothing better to do that night. Yes, I imagine sure. he would show up, you know, and and rise up out of the shadows, like in 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 his kind of you know very scary Batman form, and scare the riders off, and, or, or whatever the you know, the, the looters off, or whatever it is that he, you know, he wants to do. But this is a situation where he knows there are people who people whose lives are in danger, like every second that this is going on, and he decides to spend his time differently. I'm, I'm going to go help people whose lives are in imminent danger rather than deal with these people who are stealing some televisions. That to me did not seem like an unreasonable. Thing not at all. I, I mean, no, I agree 100% with you. It was, but it was that interesting thing of you get to that page, like, oh, like it's unexpected. It makes sense. It definitely in the story you're telling, but I also loved it for establishing who your Batman is. And right. a similar thing of, you know, how like uh, in the, the, the beginning, right? There's just burglars breaking into Wayne Manor. Of course, Bruce Wayne clowns him out, but then so does Alfred. And right. Alfred does it honestly a little bit more impressively than Pretty Bruce cool. does, right? right. Like, that's <laughs> awesome. Like you, and there's all those different versions of Batman or for Alfred, whether we're talking about movies or comics or whatever, right? And so it was rad to see that. I think it's one of it's one of the nice things about working with established characters is the audience gets to be a little bit ahead of characters on the page. So as soon as you, like, literally on the first page, is like three guys breaking into Wayne Manor, right? And as the comic, as the they don't know who lives there. Right. But as the audience, you're going, oh, shit, you don't know who lives there. And that's, again, part of the fun. It's like, oh, man, you, that's the one place in Gotham City you should not you be trying to break into. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and so and so there's a little bit, of, again, when you're working with established characters and people already know, like, where everyone is kind of set up on the chessboard, you can have some fun with that. And I thought that was cool, too, even in the, the senior time um, earlier where we see the penguin like drowning that woman. It's like it's only like a page. But right. it really tells the story. It's just like we right. know who Bat who Penguin is. We understand. Cool. There's that, and like just the way that those couple pages work, I think is really interesting. Of like showing what he's doing that night, and you know, Arkham, everyone's out. There's this power outage everywhere. What's gonna happen? And like for a story that does seem like it's been done a million times, of yo, all the chaos is happening at once. I really thought issue one did a good job of kind of like giving us like the highlights of yo, if we already got the Joker and penguin and all this stuff now like what are we building up to and i think that that's something that's really exciting because this did a great job of being totally consistent with what i expect from a batman story but also kind of setting the stage of like cool let's get some of the expected hype moments out of the way mm -hmm. to allow the the kind of like intrigue to begin of like i can't wait for the next issue like i'm so interested in where the story's going yeah part of it, it's funny i, I it's not i wouldn't say it's a regret i might do it a little bit differently if i was if i was coming at it again now is like the story ends up going to so many interesting places and issue two is like there's a massive like independence day style battle with all of the justice league against this alien ship and we kill off a major character and we go to we eventually bruce goes all over the world and uh the, the, this whole kind of alien thing and there's like a whole sub story of that superman that's really interesting we do we go to all these different corners of the dc universe but issue one i wanted to kind of ground it and just do like a traditional you know gotham centric sure. bat book um and there is this like there is this idea that it kind of starts in this like for example when you know gordon first calls batman in and says you know we've got a blackout all over the city he doesn't know what batman knows and he had batman has to tell him like it's not just all over the city it's all over the planet because how would you know right if power's out yeah. and you're not getting information and so i was kind of having some fun with that and it is i wanted to I, you know i did just kind of want to do a bit of fan service to myself i want to see batman fight the joker i want to see batman fight the penguin i want to see him fighting crime in gotham city i want to see gordon lighten the bat signal you kind of want to do you know to, to kind of check all those little fanboy boxes um my only regret is i don't think the first book 
adequately really sets up just how crazy it gets in later issues. I mean, there is a set, like the final page is like, we're going to go fight these fucking aliens now. And you go, oh, you're going to want to see that in issue two. But beyond that, like it's if issue one feels like a very traditional kind of Batman on the streets of Gotham story, whereas like the rest of like everything else is nothing. I don't think we ever even go back to Gotham after, after issue one because Bruce is too busy going all around the world. Um, so it's a, it was a little bit of kind of fan service. Me, like, I just wanted, I just wanted to see God, you know, Gordon like the bat signal, right? Like, you just, I just want to have that moment. I remember well, you when made I it so saw, difficult for him. Just well, like, yeah, because there's no power, I right? I want to see him light it, but there's no power. There's what no do power, <laughs> right? So they have to figure out a way to do it. And again, to your, to your point, Tim, is this idea of like, they don't need to light the bat signal to, to alert Batman that something's wrong, right? He's, he knows, right? Because the power's out everywhere. Like, he knows that the Gotham's in chaos. It's more that idea of, you know, just by lighting the signal it might get i think gordon literally says just by seeing the signal it might convince some people to not go out there and cause trouble because that's one of the things that the bat signal has become right it was the matt reeves thing right it's not a signal it's a warning and and yeah. chris nolan dealt with it as well the idea just seeing the signal in the sky kind of reminds people batman's out there you might not want to you know go out committing crimes tonight so earlier, again it was a lot earlier, of kind of lot of, so, you know, can check in some of those fan fanboy boxes for me in issue one Earlier you were saying that uh, in writing scripts, like if you have that one line that sometimes like you write a whole thing about it, and, like that's all it takes. Like I think right. that there is there's like a a line, like a a scenario with Joker that I feel just rides that line of being <laughs> something I've seen before, but takes it in such a great direction. Where I was like, that is an awesome Joker moment. I didn't, you know, hey, kudos which, to you, which man. was it? What was it? Uh, the just the idea of the I don't want to spoil too much because I do want people to. We said to we were this. spoiling. I know it. we're spoiling it, but like still, uh -huh. I I think that there's special moments here that are like, like cool. We already spoiled that he faces the Joker, but like what exactly happens? I think you should see because it is very much more brutal than I expected. Um, but it is the idea of him looking at the kids and the oh right yeah yeah that I thought I was like look we've seen things like this before sure, but I thought it was very well done here and like that to me read as one of those lines of like this whole section was started from that yeah moment. so tim I'm, no, i mean that's a perfect example of what i was just talking about so again like we're in a spoiler car so I, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to kind of talk about it in a bit Go more detail it. but the idea of like <laughs> again the idea of batman like where he's got he's basically got joker white right where he wants him right and like he could kill him like he could just end this now it's like this, this guy if i don't kill him now he's gonna come back of course more trouble and more trouble and more trouble i know as batman i'm not supposed to kill anyone but maybe with this motherfucker finally i should make an exception and just do the world a favor and just take if i could take this guy off the chessboard for good and so again, we've seen that a million times before, and I do it in this book. But I, again, the thing with the kids is like, he he does it in this case for a very specific reason. And so that, that, that that's a perfect example, Tim, of what we were just saying about you've seen that you've seen this. You, we've been in this space before, but here's like a slightly different angle on it that hopefully makes it a bit fresh for people. So I'm glad you I'm glad that you appreciated that. So you said you know and you've because you've been talking to me about this for a long time because you're a good friend and you know how much i love this nerdy shit that you know how crazy the book's gonna get and you can't believe you're getting away with it with dc was there any pushback when you pitched them where all these uh, eight issues are gonna go that they're like you can't do that are they no and i don't and i don't want to overstate it because you know comics do such crazy shit all the time right sure. i don't know i went by the time the book is done i definitely think People are going to go. Oh wow, you went to a you went to a place that I didn't expect. I hope so, and I think we'll probably piss some people off. Um, <laughs> you know, to probably I think there's some people that won't like where the story goes, but I think a lot of people will really get a kick out of it. Um, and that, that to me, like you know, I would rather have that reaction than people just going, "Yeah, it was all right." You know, you want to have sure. people kind of on both like, having strong feelings about it on on either side of the equation. But no, I was I was genuinely like I remember when I wrote the story uh, outline. Uh, basically the way that this worked was Ben was like, okay, I write this all out. And like every month we get together with like Jim Lee and like the senior, you know, kind of, you know, editorial board at DC. Yeah. And we, re we review all the pitches and we decide which ones are going to uh, go forward. And I wrote it and I said to Derek, they're never going to, the, when, when they see like the, what, the last page, they're never going to let us do this. And I, I was like, but we should do it this way. This is the thing that I learned from Rogue One was, you know, in the first draft of Rogue One, we didn't kill everybody because I knew it was the right decision, but I worried that Disney, Disney wouldn't let us do it. Mm. And, but, and in the end, of course, we did do it. And the one thing I learned from that was like, never like always like go in like with your full chest with a story idea you believe in. Like, don't talk yourself out of doing something you really believe in because you think someone else is going to say no. And I applied that. to It was like, I, I really want to tell this story. I really want to kind of reinvent a couple of aspects of, 
um, of the DC universe in a way that I think is going to be controversial, but is going to be really cool and thought provoking. But like, I don't know, DC is going to say, you've got to be kidding. We're not going to let you do that. Um, but I was like, I'm gonna, I, I, I got, I want to at least try again. I want to, I want to kind of take you gotta shoot your shot. Rogue one. You got to shoot your shot. So I wrote it out and, uh, it went in and we didn't hear, hear anything for a couple of weeks. I'm like, yeah, they're never going to do this. And then Ben called back and said, you're approved. I was like, really? <laughs> uh, and so we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing it. And yeah, that was, yes, the, uh, absolutely. To answer your question, I absolutely was like, they're never going to let us do this, but they are. So I have a question that I, I only mean out of love. But one of my least favorite things when it comes to comic books is it's a six issue run. It's going to be monthly. Here I am a year and a half later and issue three is coming out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Do you yeah. think we're going to get monthly releases of this? Have you wrote all of them? Like what's the status of the, the so the so way, far? yeah. So it's interesting the way to so give you like an, like a little look into kind of the, the way that it works, the production process on that. I started writing, I wrote issue one, like, I don't know, probably almost a year ago. Um, because these things take a while to do. They so they, they don't take long to write, but they take a long time to draw. Uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, like, I can write like you know the entire Justice League you know bursts in, and like that takes me five seconds to write. It takes Derek 18 hours to draw something like that. You know, he just sent me a page that that, that, that took him 18 hours to draw. It took me five minutes to write. And you and you often realize that artists don't get enough credit because oh, they yeah. just, oh, just yeah. they do so much more work. It's so much more painful. Like writing's not easy, but like neither is drawing, and it's much more labor intensive and much harder to do um and so right now for example so issue one's out um issue two will be out you know a, a, a few weeks from now i am currently in the middle of writing issue eight um i'm reviewing uh, colors on issue three we'll get lettering on issue three in a couple of in a couple of days derek's currently drawing issue five um i'm looking at inks on issue five so you know it, 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 there's each issue is in a different part of the like issues one like issue two is completely done and finished and ready to ship issue three is fully colored and i'm just waiting on final lettering um i think i have final inks on four i'm, I'm reviewing inks on five right now um derek i think is, is is still in the middle he's in the middle of drawing five and um i'm, I'm writing the script for issue eight so all you know, the whole run of it is in like different stages of of production based on you know that that schedule but i know what you mean like it's tough right and m monthly is tough like we're used to kind of we you know, episode like we're used to weekly episodes on tv shows like obi-wan kenobi an episode every week stranger things you get it all at once right you don't have to wait anymore yeah. but for comic books are still monthly so yeah. this thing start this thing started this month in in may it's eight issues this thing you you won't get to you know i'm like i said i'm writing issue eight right now but you won't get to see that until like the end of the year or early, like maybe January of next year, depending on, I don't remember exactly how the schedule goes, but you know, it's seven months away. Right. And there's, you know, you know how many months in a year there are. So it can take a while. It's why I think a lot of people, I, it's very, very helpful when people buy the individual issues because it helps people, it helps DC understand that they've got a successful book, but a lot of people choose to wait for you know, the trade paperback, the graphic novel version to come out, you know, at the end of that run. Mm -hmm. So they can just sit there and kind of binge it all at once. Yeah, I gotta be honest. That's how I prefer to do it, but <laughs> because I, I I honestly do as well because I like to I don't like to have the individual issues on my shelf. I like to have like the you know the yeah, graphic novel yeah, with a nice spine and yeah, yeah and you, and you don't you know it's nice you know, tune in a month is a long time to wait. I get it, long, but, and and it's, the book it, is, the the book is very much but you but you write in that you write in that way though. Like if I was writing this as a graphic novel where you re, where you would re, no you read it all at once, I wouldn't mm -hmm. I wouldn't have those cliffhanger moments. Every issue is structured to end on a you know, or you're going to want to, yeah. you're going you're gonna to want to read the next issue to see what happens next. Like every, every issue has a, has a cliffhanger. If I didn't have to worry about that, I, w I wouldn't write it in that. I, I wouldn't worry about like, five, like every 22 pages, we need to hit a, we need to hit a cliffhanger so people will tune in, you know, for the next issue. We've debated, we've debated that a lot back and forth with, with television shows and streaming stuff. Um, and I've, I've, I've come back around to the idea of weekly. Cause I, I do think that there's a special kind of energy to that where, where you let a story sit for a bit, but I will say I watched. I know spoilers. I watched all of Stranger Things season four, part one last week, and I was so glad, so glad I could sit there and binge it. And these are 78 minute long episodes. Some of them are even longer. And it just brought me right back to that. Like, let's get snacks. Let's do that whole thing. But to me, I think it's just to me, I, I'm, I'm dumb and I can't remember what happened <laughs> before. So if there's a day that goes by, I'm like, what happened last yesterday with this thing? I don't know. I got to get it all crammed in. I don't know. But I don't, I don't like the binge model. I, I really, I really, I, I don't like the Netflix model at all. I much prefer the Disney plus model of, you know, the old fashioned model of just releasing a show every week. Cause the problem is I don't have time to binge a show. And then, and then soon as like the within, within however, how long does it take to watch like 
the, the 10 hours that it takes to watch every episode of Stranger Things, spoilers mm -hmm. for the season finale are, are out there the next morning, right? Because people have binged right. it. They've got right. their recaps up there. If I can't keep up with you, I have to be dodging spoilers, at least on a weekly basis when everyone's on the same diet and rationed out. Mm -hmm. And I honestly think Netflix kind of misses a trick when they do it this way. It's like that drip, drip, drip. Like right now, everyone's like talking about episode three of Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? Because it just drops, right? And everyone's seeing it on the same schedule. I think that that, you know, the internet is wonderful for this kind of stuff. Everyone's posting their recaps and everyone, you know, is talking about what's, what happened that week on, you know, mm -hmm. any given show. But when it all drops at once, I think it's really hard for people to kind of be on the same page in terms of the oh, conversation definitely. of where the story is. Definitely. But I think, but I think just from like a, just from a storytelling standpoint, like in the, the Stranger Things, obviously like really, really takes a cue out of uh, you know, Stephen King books, uh, books in general, because, you know, they even call their, their episodes chapters. And that's for good reason. When you see it all at once, it feels like you're reading a book you can't put down. And I mm -hmm. think there's something special to that that not a lot of other shows, really not a lot of other mediums get to. Um, when you get the week to week, you get that excitement of the week to week. You have to program in the cliffhanger. But then they have to do, you have to get the story recaps going. And it's so nice to actually just be sitting in the pocket of a five hour long narrative and just being totally engrossed by all the planes of actions that are happening because they don't have to go back and rebuild that momentum for each, you know, if Hopper's stuck in the, the Russian gulag or whatever that, you don't have to remind me of who the characters are around him. I know where he's at. And I think for specifically for Stranger Things, they did a really good job this last season with with all the, the levels of uh, action that are happening during some of the climaxes. You're just you feel for every single one of them, even even some of the story elements that kind of dragged at the beginning of it, just because you have that experience. And I don't know that I would have hit that same level if I were watching over the course of seven. No, weeks. I hear you. It's, it's funny. I end up, I end up binging most shows anyway, just because I come to them late, right? Like Me for too. example, like I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm still working through severance, right? I mean, that was dropped on Ooh, a weekly a show. schedule, yeah. but I wasn't able to watch it when it was on that weekly release. And by the time I came to it, every episode was already out. Right. right. So I come to it late. I can binge it if I want, but like, I remember, like, I think it was like last year or the year before that HBO Perry Mason show. Uh, with Matthew Reese, did was, you like that? I, I I didn't like it until like halfway through when I realized where they were going with it. Uh, okay, I got three right? I got three episodes in. I was like, I don't. I don't oh, know, you meandering. you dropped out before before the penny yeah. drops on that show though. It got, I, I was the same thing. I was like, this isn't Perry Mason, but it is. It just takes them a while for them to get yeah. there. It's very cleverly it done in that slow, regard. Yeah, but... it was really so. But I loved it. Right, it was beautiful. Mm. The production values were great. I love Matthew Reese. Um, and so by the time we were like really into it. And you know you want you know you watch the episode and you go oh we've got to wait an episode we've got to wait a week for next episode like in a way that you feel like that kind of sucks because we have now all been conditioned to kind of drink from this fire hose right like you can have as much as you want when you want it um, but it's a, but it's a but it's a good anticipation though it's like you know then you have to like you know you're looking forward to the next episode all week like I remember Leo and I go oh new new Perry Mason tomorrow night you know we get to sit down and watch that I kind of like that forced. Mm. drip 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 and that's yeah. you know maybe it's because it's the model that i grew up with like no. you didn't have the binge model when i was a kid. i think it just no, worked i think wrong. it's show to show and like yeah. uh, property to property in a lot of ways whereas like the disney plus stuff when it started i was like like wandavision i remember being like oh man week to week uh and then it was so much fun for that kind of show to do the episode and then for a week you got about theories and where you thought it was going to go and da, 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 and what's that and then you know the cliffhanger with the uh, spoilers quicksilver and stuff like that it was like what the fuck like there's so many great moments tied up to that kind of thing. Whereas mm -hmm. like, you know, the other one for us is Ozark where we love Ozark. And so when we, we the way we watched Ozark was like, you know, the final season that just, or the final, the yeah, the final season, but the final mm -hmm. half of whatever this last season, we were watching it like one and a half a night, which was great for me and Jen. But then like, I know Kevin loved Ozark, but there was never a point to be like, where are you? All right, well, what's happening? And, that's, and so like, I've never really talked to anyone about Ozark. Just really loved Ozark. Had a great ride the entire time, but I haven't had that same social mm -hmm. communicative thing. It was great for Jen yeah. and I, right? Like even like the staircase now. I'm so stoked for just random ass Thursday nights now to get the next episode of the staircase. And, and there's definitely shows like that that I have, right? The three shows that I'm watching right now that I look forward to on a weekly basis. Actually, HBO is doing interesting. They're dropping they're, they're dropping hacks two episodes at a time, which, which is like actually is fucking great. great. <laughs> but it's also sad because it's like, fuck, it's about to be over so quickly. Over. Like, but dude, Tim, I don't know if you had this experience, but I watched, they dropped the first episode and I saw that there was two up and I was like, oh, that's cool. They're dropping two episodes to get people excited about it, right? The next week comes, I do episode three and then it goes, would you like to watch episode four? And I'm like, did I just yeah. win the lottery? Dude, what the I'm fuck right is there happening? with you. I Here, thought it Are you watching out. Hacks? 
It's it's weird because we are in such a transitional time, right? Where you know the, the the days of like linear, you know, network and cable television are kind of going away, and we're so used to. I mean, again, I'm old. It seems so old fashioned, but I'm old enough to remember like you know rushing home to catch a TV show on time before it started. I mean, that's you kidding? dead now. That's make, long gone. I used that to have went, to make a big bowl of popcorn to right? catch the X-Files. I had to have that popcorn and the soda. All the stuff melted to get X-Files and Briscoe County Jr. Ooh, Briscoe County. Right. Now, yeah, you, yeah, now you can still anymore. have appointment television, right? Everyone tuned in 9 p.m. Sunday night to watch Game of Thrones or The Sopranos or whatever. But again, you could watch it you know, this whole thing, like, oh, I've got, you've got to get home before it starts. You know, that went, you know, went out with TiVo and the, when the DVR came along. But again, now in the in, in the streaming world, now it's it's how do people want to consume shows? And Netflix have committed very, very hardcore to this, which is going to dump it all at once and you're going to binge it. And it seems to be working for them, right? Stranger Things 4 has been hugely, hugely successful. There's no indication but, that that model is holding it back at all. But it's only half the season. So it's right. interesting to note that they they wanted to get that out as fast as possible. And, that, and, that, and that's what's interesting, right? So behind. there's so many different, ex like everyone's experimenting. Everyone's trying different things, right? So you've got Netflix that will, that will drop a whole season all at once. And then you've got Disney Plus that does the old fashioned, you know, you'll get a new Obi Wan every week. And then you've got like, didn't when yeah, Amazon HBO did the boys, didn't they drop like they dropped like a three or four three, episodes? Like yeah. you could do a mini binge, but then it went onto a weekly schedule. So they're trying all these different things, trying to figure out what you know how people want to consume shows, and everyone's got a different approach. Yeah, Tim, I'm with you. Sorry, I interrupted you, but that's exactly what I thought too. I saw hacks. And I thought it was a glitch of some sort. Like we game the system. Yeah. No, dude, it's everyone should watch hacks. It's honestly incredible. And like the season two somehow just as good, if not better than season one. But yeah, I, I'm a fan of the different types of distribution. And I feel like there's not a one size fits all. And I like that everyone's kind of doing well, their look, own look, thing. Look, 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 okay, but let me ask you this. If you were the, if you were like the, the emperor of television mm -hmm. and, and, and so, and you had the power to decide that from now on, all TV, all streamers are going to be on the same model. It's either every, everything gets dropped all at once and you binge it or everything goes back to week, weekly. And you got you got to pick a side. Which way are you going? If I had to pick a side that everything would be released binge. at, I would probably go the Amazon model where three episodes at once and then weekly after that. I might even argue two episodes to, to lead. I think three is too much. Two episodes to lead and then weekly so like after a, I guess, that. So like a double feature to kind of get you started and then, yeah. and then you're on the weekly ration. Get people like more excited, especially for like IP, like things like Severance or, or even Hacks, where it's like, I'm just going to give this new show a shot that somebody recommended or whatever. And it's like, I feel like you want to have that. Oh, I want more of this. But I do think that like it quickly becomes too much more. Um, and the thing is, like, I, I'm a fan of having new things to watch. And I'm definitely a fan of talking about those new things with people as like a shared experience. So I think that kind of maximizes those potential opportunities for me. And um it just seems like people enjoy shows more that way um, overall and for longer. Um, and the thing is, if you want to wait and binge, you can do that in just a couple of weeks, especially with how short seasons sure. are becoming, right? Like it's not often TV shows nowadays are getting 20 plus episode seasons like, you know, Disney plus going all the way down to six. It's like that is a low it's amount. Just especially now in this day and age right where we don't watch tv shows in a vacuum anymore right we all consume them together right so mm -hmm. that weekly thing of like i remember when like when breaking bad was like the show that i remember watching breaking bad every week and game of thrones every week and it wasn't just the experience of watching the show but it was the next morning right everyone and yeah the, the, those kind of the, the, the water cooler ideas like moved into social media now so everyone's talking about the show the next day you're reading the recaps you're all experiencing it and like every every it wasn't just about the sunday night it was about the monday morning as well when everyone's reacting to and comparing notes together and that was a weekly thing that you that, that we look forward to when it gets dumped all at once you still have it but it just all happens all at once and it's almost again it is like it's like drinking from a fire hose it's too much to kind of take in all at once like 10 hours of content i also think like i don't really think we show i mean you can obviously you can if you want but i don't know i mean do, would you want to watch a 10 hour movie probably not but that's basically what you're doing when you binge you know a whole season of a show all at once yeah but you binge them over the the span of a few days but you're right i mean listen I, using the Stranger Thing model, there's seven episodes, hours and hours of content. It's great. It finished. And I was like, you know what? For the first time in a while, I'm actually glad I get a little bit of a breathing room between this and the the last couple episodes. I mean, because um, it was I, intense. It was a lot of content, but beautifully made. But I'm I'm not mad that those next two, have, I, if, if they were out, I probably would have watched them. But I'm looking forward to July 1st when they drop. I'm, I'm, I'm fully aware as well as I think about my own experience with this, I am being a bit hypocritical there as well. I remember when I got the wire box set, like years, yeah. I, I got tired of people, wow. 
I got, I got tired of people giving me like funny looks when I told them I'd never watched The Wire. I was like, you've got to watch. It's one of the greatest shows of all time. So I got the, I remember like at one point like the DVD box set was on special on Amazon and I got it. And I was up until like four o'clock in the morning every fucking night for like a week watching every episode because like you just could, you could not watch the next one, you know? Like, and so sometimes you do want to binge. Sometimes the show is so good that if the next episode is there, you can't not watch it. Are you, I have to ask two questions. Are you watching The Offer at all on Paramount? No, I, 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 the, the subject matter is very interesting to me. It's, it's on my list, but I have an embarrassing backlog of shows. It's, it's one of the many shows I need to watch. Paramount um, is on, it has a little gold mine. They're basically, the, for those of you who don't know, I don't know, Greg, if you're familiar with this show. It's no. a, a narrative retelling of, based on the true events surrounding um, them making the Godfather movie. Oh, I saw a promo for this. Okay. And it's, I read, I read a book um, a while back about the making of Chinatown, uh, which was another movie that Paramount had, I think right after Godfather. That was, it was, they had the one, two, three punch of hits from Love Story to The Godfather to Chinatown. And they referenced Chinatown in this one. And I'm like, I wonder if they're going to go back. Because it all follows sort of Robert Evans when he was uh, the head of Paramount back in the day. And for those of you that don't know, they talked about him as being, you know, he was very, very cavalier. He he was he was a, a much storied uh, studio head. Uh, uh, and his the three hits that he provided for them was Love Story, Godfather, and Chinatown. And they were all very contentious when they got made. But it's really, really fascinating to see all the all the relatively true events that happen. Specifically, they get involved with the mob. He's got to make literally he gets offers he can't refuses. Uh, that's Robert Evans, and, and the, the producer it follows Miles Teller, who's the producer of, uh, of of the movie. But it's so well done, and I hope to God they go and do another season where they do Chinatown after this. Cause it's not, it wouldn't be Miles Teller, but it's just a cool idea of going back and doing really high end, like one single season stories for all these incredible movies that we all, you know, these classics. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. It's on my list. It's, it's frankly embarrassing how many backlog TV show. Like I finally, like, because here's the problem that I have and Greg knows what I'm talking about. And I've said this many times before and it's, but it is embarrassing. I have all these like high, Fluting idea like tonight i'm going to sit down i'm going to watch that movie or i'm going to watch that tv show that everyone's talking about i'm going to and as someone who works in the business right i should have a high quality diet right i should be consuming the kind of stuff that i aspire to make which is like good quality movies and good quality tv shows but by the time we get both of these kids in bed <laughs> like I, I i just i end up this is what this is why i end up watching you, you know <laughs> i end up watching fucking snowbite mike on twitch yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, i mean I just something i can this. have on in the background and kind of watch but is it going to tax me or mm -hmm. fucking whatever bullshit like you said storage wars or like yeah you know, comfort tv right stuff that you yeah. stuff that you enjoy having on like, like old yeah you know, it might be old sitcom reruns or whatever and For this me, is how yeah, the backlog builds up for me, Gary, it's, uh, you know, I can't wait to play games. I can't wait to play games. I can't wait to play games. We get right. Ben to sleep. Jen and I spend some time together. She goes to bed. And yep. then I turn on the game, and I'll find myself falling asleep at the controller. And so then I'll turn off the game, and then but then it's that thing of, like, what? I, I just, and I'm on TikTok for 30 to 45 minutes. Yeah, game, game, games, are, games are the worst because. Just, trying to fucking get something going. If you think about like the bottom end of the, like the, 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 the engagement spectrum, like again, I, I, I've watched any number, like that was a thing where I was obsessed with storage wars for a while because like, it's just, sure. I, it's the easiest thing in the world to watch. And it doesn't require any kind of mental taxation or engagement at all. There's any number of reality shows that will scratch that itch. If you want to watch like a prestige movie, you do need to kind of be dialed in, right? And yeah, you're, be present. And you're expected yeah. to, you know, to be properly like paying attention. Um, video games are worse even than that, right? Because they're interactive and you are expected to be like literally fully engaged with it. You could, it's not a passive thing. So I'm, I'm the same as you. Like tonight, I'm finally going to sit down and play. Like there's this game Citizen Sleeper right now on Xbox that I really want to play and the people keep telling me good things about. Every night I'm like, tonight I'm going to start that game. And I end up watching, like, like you said, fucking scrolling TikTok or something because I just don't have it in me anymore. Yeah, you just, you're, you, you, I've, and I've had it happen actually where I fall asleep playing the game. I wake up and I'm like, well, I, I'm on a little, little TikTok reward before I go to bed. And then that wakes me back up and I go back to the game. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> All right, now I got a second win. Thanks. I just needed to struggle through this and now I'm back to what I need to do. Yeah, it's not fun. Gary, I, yes. Sorry, Batman Fortress. Yes, number one out right now. You got a variant cover there because I, I gave you, but I, I gave you all <laughs> you three. You came by, I gave you the whole thing. There's yeah, the, the basic one, upstairs. and there's two variant covers as well. Yeah, main so covers upstairs. I was reading. I think there, we're right. doing variants all through the run, actually. So like for the collectors out there, you can get like the 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 rare. And there's one you've got one there as well. The the one kind of like, like Batman swinging through the dark and city. That's yeah. called the ratio cover, and that's like only one in every twenty five issues is that cover. 
So that's like the really rare one for super collectors. Gotcha. Um, what other projects do you want to promote? What are you, what are you working on? What, are, what can you tell us about? I'm glad you brought that up because I'm going to want to come back soon and plug okay. some other bullshit of mine. Yeah. So this is, actually, this is actually something that I'm really interested in. Prom like, I'm glad to be here, right? But Batman Fortress does not need me to promote it, right? Because it's DC Comics and it's in, in, in comic stores, stores everywhere. They have their own publicity and marketing machine that like promotes these sure. things. But like the big thing for me recently is... And just in a holistic way, I've kind of started to kind of transition more towards doing projects on my own terms that I completely own and control. Because I've worked on any number of movies and projects where, you know, you're working on working with someone else's property, you've been hired to do it, or even if it's your own thing, right? You're relying on other people. Movies are expensive to make, TV shows are expensive to make. You're relying on other people to come along and, and help you do it, right? I can't make my own big budget TV show. I can't make my own big budget movie. Um, I need other people to, to to come work with me, and I've got to convince them that it's something that's worth their time and money to do. Basically, 90% of my job is is dependent on asking someone else for their money and all their permission. And I kind of got tired of it because I you, know, you you get the rug pulled out from under you all the time. Sure. Big movies get canceled at the last minute. I you know I, I wrote. A, um, uh, I wrote a movie for uh, 20th Century Fox that was six weeks away from production, $40 million spent in pre-production, and, and then Disney came along, bought Fox, and decided they didn't want to make it, pulled the plug, and all that work's wasted. And it's heartbreaking, and it happens too, it happens too often in this business, not, so, not just to me, but to everyone that uh, kind of works at this level. And so I'm increasingly trying to find ways to kind of like get around all the gatekeepers, not require anyone else's money or permission to get a story in front of an audience. And so like Oliver, I, I mentioned earlier, Oliver, Oliver was a screenplay that I was never going to get made. So I did it as a comic book that was easier to get done. Um, I wrote another thing you know, called Abomination, which was you know, originally, yeah. again, meant to be a feature film. Couldn't figure out a way to get it made. So I wrote it as a novel instead. And that got published. And you know, found, again, I just care about stories finding an audience. And so the newest thing is I wrote this big science fiction thing that is like very i always want to do something with like big fuck off mechs like big giant walking tanks i've always loved that universe um whether it be like mech warrior or battle tech or you know i've, I've never like been like, like really deeply into them i just love the idea of big fucking giant robots smashing the shit out of each other yeah. like, i want to do a story like that but did again you, big, did you pass on robotech at some point i, I did because they sent a... me a script to rewrite and the script was written by lawrence kasdan oh right I'm like yeah i'm not <laughs> fucking no, no, I, no. I literally sent it back saying i'm not going to rewrite a script <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> i actually got to story. tell lawrence kasdan that story at the rogue one premiere and he gave me a weird look he i don't like, think he was appreciative idiot it was, take the money <laughs> <laughs> he's like yeah why would you take the money um so yeah, but when he's teasing i just slacked you if you want to throw up the art so what i did so what i did with this yeah, new thing that i haven't um announced yet but basically I was like, okay, I want to do a big thing with big robots, and I know exactly what the story is that I want to tell. I also know that if I write it as a screenplay, which is going to cost $100 million to make, given that my name isn't J.J. Abrams or Christopher Nolan, no one's going to make it. I'm going to spend a ton of time writing this thing. I'm going to fall in love with it, and then 20 readers around Hollywood, all the studios are going to pass on it, and it goes and sits on a shelf, and no one ever sees it. 99% um, of the work that I've done in my career is stuff that you'll never see. It was work that I got very well paid for it, but it came to nothing, right? I've been in this business for 20 years and I've had three feature films made and I'm considered successful. Uh, and and it's, it's, it, what you don't see is, you know, the, what the, the iceberg under the, like Rogue One, After Earth and, and, um, and Book of Eli are like the part of the iceberg that breaks the surface of the water and is visible. The work and, and, and Abomination and other things as well. That's the work that I've done that, you know, you see where there's a visible kind of, hey, look, here's something I made. What yeah, you don't game. see is this is is the seven eighths of the iceberg that's under the water, which is all the projects that I poured my heart and soul into, but for whatever reason, just never got across the finish line. So I've been trying to find ways, you know, to to kind of work smarter and and bring stories to an audience in a way that has a greater possibility of like becoming part of the iceberg that you do see. I'm torturing this analogy, but you know what I mean. Yeah. And definitely. so with so with the mech thing. Rather than write it as a feature film or rather than write it as a TV show, which is very unlikely to get made, it's like, how can I do this in a way that I get, can guarantee that I know people will see it? I'm very fortunate to have a social media following. People know who I am from my previous work, particularly Star Wars gave me a big profile. People know who I am, and not millions of people, but enough people know who I am that they'll check out the next thing that I do. So I wrote it as a novel instead, like I did with Abomination. But I wanted to kind of take the next step. And so what I ended up doing was we've been working on this for the past year. I'm going to announce it very soon. We also, I also self-produced and adapted 
um, the book as an audio, like a narrative audio drama, like a oh, like cool. a like a narrative podcast. And we, I did it with professional actors, and they were they're, I, they're all people that you know, uh, professional actors, professional composers. Uh, we put it all together. We did it all on a shoestring budget as a nine. Basically, it's going to be released as an audio podcast uh, over the rad. course of nine weekly episodes. But what we're going to do, I think, is really cool is the broadcast, like the flagship version of it will actually be a Twitch. Um, I'm going to put it on my Twitch channel every week. We'll do a live broadcast where I'll show up kind of like the fucking, remember like Masterpiece Theater, the guy yeah, in the leather yeah, yeah. armchair and the smoking yeah, jacket. Yeah. Tonight's no story. So I'll come and introduce it as the author of the thing. And then we're going to run this like hour long audio drama that people can kind of like be in the chat and react to and listen to in oh, real wow. time. So like if I if it's like I make like a major plot twist or I kill off a character or whatever, people in the chat can kind of go, oh, my God, you can have that kind of feeling of like a communal event you know, where people are reacting to and experiencing the story in real time together. And then at the end of each episode, I'll come back on camera, much as I am here right now and participate in like a live author Q&A book club discussion, whatever you want to call it. I'll answer questions about it. We'll talk about what's coming up on the next episode. And we're going to do that over the course of nine weeks. And wow. so the reason why I'm banging the drum for it right now is it's it's very nice to kind of do something all by myself. No one else can, can take it away from me. I own it. I control it. No one can pull the rug out from under me. But it means that when the time comes to promote it, there's no Lucasfilm, there's no Disney, there's no DC, there's just me and my social media profile and coming on shows like this saying, please go look at this. So in a few weeks, when that's actually ready to roll out, I'll probably be come back and an annoying you to talk about Hell that. yeah, dude. You know you're always welcome here. Yeah, my, thank you. My closing question for you is, does this have anything to do, even remotely or anecdotally or just on the side with robot jocks? No, although that that, that, was, that was probably my first exposure to the big fuck off robots that I'm such a yeah. big fan of. <laughs> and I find it interesting film. that it's, it, you know, it's obviously hugely popular in, in Japan, right? Gundam and, mm -hmm. and, and, and mech, you know, whether it, you know, Robotech, Battletech, there's all these kind of things. And the mech warrior video games are, are popular, but like outside of like Pacific Rim and like one or two other things, I, it's never, I've never, never I, I never felt like they got their like full do like in Western like, where's the big budget Hollywood, you know, mech movie? Why don't we have that? Good question. It pisses me off. Good question. And you're going to fix it. You're well, that's, that's, it. well, hopefully we'll see. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Kind of Funny Podcast. Each and every week, so, four, sometimes five best friends gather on this table, coming to BS with each other about whatever it is they want to BS about. If you want to BS with us, patreon.com slash kind of funny, where, of course, you could be watching live right now as we head in to do the Patreon exclusive post show. Of course, you could also get all that on demand and ad free all on patreon.com slash kind of funny. What a deal. Of course, if you have no bucks tossed our way, no big deal. YouTube.com slash kind of funny, roosterteeth.com, podcast services around the globe each and every week for a brand spanking new episode chock full of ads no post show but you still have a great time right now we're going to go to the post show and answer a question from drew tendo 64 but until next time thank you gary everybody pick up batman fortress be looking for it on the monthly you can get issue one right now at your local comic book store comicsology <gasps> and until next time no it's been our pleasure to serve you